Don't you understand? You're the other woman. No! You're married to me! She's the other woman! <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever heard that iconic line by Emily, the corpse bride? Emily says this to Victor Van Dor after upsetting Emily by revealing that he had, in fact, an enraged wife back in the living world. Hello, I'm Octavia Claudio. And I'm Emily Steller. And welcome back to Thumpin, Thumpin Theories, where we review crazy fan theories as true or false so you don't have to. The corpse bride is a fan favorite due to its omni ominous storyline and thrilling plot. Many of you guys listening can probably relate to the fact that a twisted plot can make or break a movie. However, in this case, Corpse Bride does not disappoint. The creepy characters and well-written film bring the whole thing together to make a cinematic masterpiece. The Corpse Bride is one of the, our ultimate favorite films by Tim Burton. It's amazing artistry, artistry in both the characters and the settings is extremely appealing to the eye. It's a movie about a lovely woman who was brutally murdered by her husband, who, which was a crook. Victor, who is one of the main characters, is having an arranged merit with a woman named Victoria Everglot. Victor was practicing his vowels in the forest on one gloomy night and laid his ring upon a branch sticking up from the ground. Little did Victor know that this would be one of the biggest mistakes of his life. He later discovered it to be Emily's hand from the dead. Emily had awoken and revealed to us that when she died, she had brought with her her family's jewels and a satchel of gold. This led many of the audience to believe that Emily was in fact an Everglot. This could be a possibility because Emily claimed to have a fortune before passing, the time period they were set in, and the physical resemblance between Victoria and Emily. The second theory that we have to discuss today is that the land of the dead is actually heaven. Many believe that this is true because the residents can do anything and not feel pain, they can freely communicate with animals, and Lord Barkus, who is the crook, he is dragged off to another realm as the characters say that he does not deserve to go to the land of the dead. As Octavia and I have done extensive research on the film and have watched it an immense amount of times, we feel that we can dissect this theory accurately. By the, by the, by the end of this podcast, we hope that you too will be able to give your own opinion on the theory and come up with your own conclusion. The three pieces of evidence that we're going to discuss today that back up the claim that Emily is a part of the Everglot family are that Emily claimed to have fortune before passing, the time period they were set in, and Victoria and Emily have similar features. The three pieces of evidence for the second theory are that the residents can do anything and not feel pain, they can freely communicate with animals, and Lord Marcus is sent to another realm as the characters say that he does not deserve to go to the land of the dead. To begin, we're going to start with the first theory by discussing that Emily has claimed to have fortune before her passing. So, when Victor had discovered Emily in the woods, he had awakened her, which made her fall into her made him fall into her world, which is called the Land of the Dead. There, Emily told Victor her life story and revealed that her family had a lot of money before Barkus murdered her and took their fortune. Emily also said that when she died, she had her family jewels in a satchel of gold. Emily said that that okay no i this signifies that emily was in fact a wealthy ha, like had in fact a wealthy family which you think that if you're wealthy in a poor town then you would acknowledge the other wealthy people who are the everglots so emily never revealed like her family or their names but just that small detail of her wealth makes me believe that and the Everglots also revealed that they had lost their fortune recently and are going through a hard time since they are penniless. This could connect the two as Barkus took Emily's fortune when she died and the Everglots are trying to recover from losing their fortune. This seems a bit suspicious to me as it never said why they lost their fortune and it's just mysteriously gone. Yeah. What do you think about that? Like... It's just small ne small details. I feel like in every episode that we have, it's just small yeah. little details that are getting picked on. Yeah. I agree. It's just, there can't be a lot of time period because, like, I'd say at least 20 years since Emily has died. And, like, Barkus, the guy that killed her. Imagine being named Barkus. <laughs> <laughs> the guy that killed her. He's like old and crusty now. So he was probably <laughs> he was probably twenty when he killed her. He's probably like forty now. 
And that gives... You think 40 is old and gross? <laughs> for him, yeah. <laughs> for Marcus. For Marcus. Yeah. And so I think that it's extremely realistic for, like, them to have lost the fortune in that time period. And they they had nothing to back themselves up on. Yeah. So there was also um, never another wealthy family mentioned in the film, which leads me to think that the Everglot family is Emily's previous family because that's a small town and they're known to be the richest. And another piece of evidence is that, like, the beginning song says, like, it could be a land-rich, bankrupt aristocracy without a penny to their name. Like, this tells us that the Everglots, like, are bankrupt since they are, in fact, the highest class in town. Mm. And so, I don't know, I just find it weird that, well, not weird, just she had fortune, like, he took it. Like, that could have been, like, a part of the family's wealth that they had. Yeah. their net worth or whatever <laughs> and now after her passing like they just suddenly go bankrupt yeah like that's a little weird mm-hmm. what do you think no i understand what you're saying yeah, yeah. so now that we've d- discussed the fact that emily had previous family wealth let's talk about the time period that it was actually set in before victor had discovered that emily was the corpse bride no one had heard about Emily's death or even acknowledged that she was gone. Based on research, we know that the corpse bride was based in the 19th century, which is when dating policies were extremely strict. Women were often split into two categories, innocent and shamefully not innocent. If you know what I mean. <laughs> I think you can kind of pick up what I'm putting out. <laughs> Women at the time, in wealthy families, were set up in marriages where they must marry that individual and were not allowed to pursue any outside relationship or interest with any other man. This meaning that if a woman were to marry or sleep with an individual against their father's wishes, then they could possibly disown the women or act as if they never existed. This leads us to the point that if some wealthy girl, or as Emily said, a beauty known for miles around, were to go missing, especially on her wedding day, then... (laughs) This leads us to the point that if some wealthy girl, or as Emily said, a beauty known for miles around, were to go missing, especially on her wedding day, then s- s- somebody would notice. The night of Emily's death, she was brutally murdered and was never never properly buried. This leads us to think that the Everglot family could have felt ashamed of their daughter for disobeying her, and they could have acted as if she was never born. This would explain why Victoria did not know about her and why her portrait was not on the wall. This could also explain why the Everglot family is now poor because Emily could have taken some of their fortune to run off and get married. Explaining the satchel of gold, the secret woods, and the improper burial. Yeah, I think that just... I don't know, I just think that's so, like, plausible. That is perfect picture right there. Like, you could not do anything, like, despite your father's wishes in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. So, the fact that she was just in the woods, in her wedding gown, with fortune like she was running off yeah to do something Mm -hmm. that no one wanted her to do and she was some wealthy girl where she claimed to be the prettiest in the land (laughs) in the fairy tale (laughs) fairest of them all yeah and now no one knows about her Mm -hmm. and she's stuck in some woods not buried like they obviously didn't care so they most definitely were just like i don't know i think she's that's just such good evidence yeah no i agree So now that we've discussed why the time period is so important to the theory, let's discuss the physical resemblance between Victoria and Emily. As we look at the two side by side, there are clearly similar features in both Emily and Victoria. We see that Emily has a very distinguished jawline, and so does Victoria, but hers is a bit more soft and wide. We can see that Emily has a very distinguished jawline, and so does Victoria, but hers is a bit softer and wider. However, we can assume that Emily's face once had that soft complexion, as she is dead and has little rotting skin and mostly bony features. We can also see that both of their noses are extremely similar. Their noses are very small and brutal, but their mouths, however, are the opposite, as Emily's is very full and big and Victoria's is very small and thin. Another similarity is their eyebrows and their eyes. They both have these big, wide eyes and these thin, curved brows. The last similarity that I have found between the two, physically, are their body shape. They both have that hourglass body with a small waist, 
in a larger chest. So, no, I've definitely noticed this when watching the movie that, I mean, it's not unheard of in animated movies to use the same template for multiple characters. Uh Uh-huh. But they do just look similar. Yeah, and I don't know, it's just like no other girl there looks like that. And you think- So especially if they came from the same family. Yeah, and there are a lot of other theories, like this is off topic, but there's other theories that- victoria was adopted which could make sense that they were both adopted together okay yeah but that could go off the script like that could fade away from her being related because victoria not victoria could have been born like 20 years later that's why she didn't know about emily Mm -hmm. but i do think there's some physical resemblance Mm -hmm. yeah now that we have discussed all the evidence that we have on the theory that emily is a part of the everglot family Let's conclude. So, do you think that she is related? Because I 100% do. I don't know. It just. I think I have to say yeah. Like, there's no other wealthy family. Where could she. She she did not just make this stuff up. She did not poof out of nowhere. She didn't get all this money, all this bag, go marry (laughs) some rich guy. Like, what? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I agree. So, this is Thumping Thumping Theories Theories Verified. Verified. So, now that we have discussed the first piece of, like, the first theory, we're going to discuss the first piece of our evidence for our second theory. This evidence is that the residents can not only, they can do anything without feeling pain. And this is contributing to the theory that the land of the dead is heaven. So, we all know that when it comes to the dead, we are highly interested in where they're going after life. And in course, by the dead go to the land of the dead. This place appears to be a mystical land of coffins, old houses, buildings, bars, and it features fun events for the characters to attend. All of the beings that ended up there seem to be having the time of their life and are celebrating with each other. They even get excited when one another show up and make it to the afterlife. One resident named Elder Gutnex expressed that he was actually never he never felt better in his life than when he was in the land of the dead. In one scene of the movie, when Victor first arrives to the land of the dead, he walks into a bar where the dead are dancing and dislocating their body parts. They are getting stabbed with weapons for fun and messing around because it does not affect them or their bodies. To many, this is a sign that they are in heaven because they are not disciplined for their actions, and they can feel no negativity or harm when they are in the land of the dead. Personally, I do not think that this signifies that they are in heaven because since they are dead, I feel like it's common sense that they are not going to feel anything. Yeah, okay, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, I also wanted to bring up how, in an early scene in the movie, Emily can, like, pop her eye out. Yeah. she has that worm. That's yeah. Like, I just thought that was cool. Yeah, that, no, that's really cool. I just, yeah, they're dead, obviously. They're yeah, not gonna okay, feel yeah. anything. I just feel like whoever came up with this theory, that's not good evidence to back that up. I don't think that could contribute to what they're trying to say. Well, I mean, also just because, just because this afterlife world resembles a sort of heaven-like place doesn't mean it is the heaven. Yeah, exactly. I just don't feel like heaven would have had anything to do with this movie. No. (laughs) Okay, so now that we've discussed the ideas that the characters can feel no harm, let's talk about how they can freely communicate with animals. We have all wished that we could talk to our pets, and in the land of the dead, that wish can come true. In the movie, there is a dog named Scraps, which ends up talking to Emily and the old science guy that helps Emily get back to the real world. Many seem to believe that heaven grants your wishes and gives you special powers, so the fact that you were able to speak to animals leads to them to believe that the land of the dead is heaven. Personally, I do not think that this can correlate to heaven because I know that it is a special power, but the idea that the gift was given by God is a scra- like a stretch yeah like it's just something that they can do it's a cartoon exactly (laughs) i don't know why they're trying to correlate that they're trying to get all their feelings i know no in my opinion i think that the land of the dead is just where people go when they have unfinished business because i feel like they're all there for a reason because well don't they like discuss through song they like discuss why they're there yes and like if they were in like heaven or hell like i don't think that this little lab guy can just bring them back to the earth 
the only reason you can go back to Earth is unfinished business, girl. Yep. So what are you doing? Yep. Yep. <laughs> so now that we have discussed our second piece of evidence, we're going to move on to the third, which states that Lord Barkus ends up going to the land of evil. Which, with a name like Lord Barkus, you'd better be going <laughs> to the land of evil. What kind of name is that? <laughs> our last piece of evidence that we have today is that most of the re- residents of the land of the dead do not like Lord Barkus, and they say that he does not deserve to go to the land of the dead because of how evil he is. We later see that he gets dragged off to a mysterious place underground, which many speculate as hell since they believe that the land of the dead is heaven. We believe that the land of the dead is in fact not heaven and that it is a place to finish unfit, unfinished business. This is because at the end of the film, you can see that Victor releases Emily's spirit, and she, vanis- she vanishes into butterflies which fly into the sky. I think that her business was finished, and so she went to heaven. As for Marcus, I think that he went to hell. And the land, the land of the dead are still waiting for their time to finish their business. Another reason that I believe this is because I don't find it plausible for the lab man to let Emily back into the real world if she was in heaven. That just sums up everything right there. Like, you don't go from heaven to earth to back to heaven. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's not how it works. Yeah. And also, it shows also, him going when, into the okay. ground. When we say heaven, are we talking, like, religious Bible heaven or no, just a heaven? No, we're talking a heaven. Okay, okay. I hope that's what they mean. <laughs> I, hope they know, I hope they mean, like, Bible heaven. I don't know. It's just, like, at the end, she's definitely going somewhere. Like, her spirit is released. Her fi- Her business was finished. Yeah. That was the thing for me, because... She was able to rest, because yeah. she's done. As for Lord Barkus, <laughs> Lord Barkus going in the ground. <laughs> That's where he got dragged. Mm-hmm. He got, yeah, dragged. Yeah, and people were like, mm, he doesn't deserve to go to Land of the Dead. I mean, Land of the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> he don't Wait, deserve what'd it. what did you say? I said Land of the Living. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now that we've discussed our second theory, let's conclude. So, do you think that the land of the dead is in fact heaven in biblical terms no <laughs> as in a sort of heaven like idea yes i just they need to specify what they mean who's they the reddit user that proposed this oh, theory who was that? that was Bubblegum125. <laughs> they just I don't they just didn't specify what they actually meant. And so I feel like <laughs> I just personally feel like it wasn't specified enough, but I do think that it resembles some heaven of the sort. Yep. I agree. Just just some place. Yep. So we also have an outsider's opinion on the first theory. Gabby Rojas says, I think that it is possible for Emily to be part of the Ever- the Everglots since it was never revealed who her real parents were and her past family was rich. Which, with this being said, I think that we can conclude that she thinks that theory one is in fact true. Which we completely agree with. Yeah. So, good on her for yeah. believing that because so do we. <laughs> it just makes so much sense. Like, in the... Her portrait's not going to be on a wall because, of course, if they're disappointed, they're not going to put her whole portrait on the wall. Mm-hmm. Just one thing I find weird is that Emily and Victoria, if they were related, they look nothing like the parents. Like, uh. the, the mom has some big head and, like, <laughs> <laughs> just weirdly shaped, and the father's stubby and short. Like, where Maybe did they... they were adopted. Exactly. Where did they get hourglass from that? They got body on body. Because <laughs> I know that none of them... Neither of them are giving that. Okay. I don't know. They just got those good jeans, I guess. I guess. The hidden jeans. Like, Victor, he looks like his parents. What are those traits called? The, the re- recessive. Oh, yeah. They got, got those recessive They got traits. the recessive. Grr. They got the good <laughs> recessive traits. They got the best one of the deck. <laughs> After listening to this podcast, I hope that you come up with your own conclusion to the theories and share more that come to your mind. The three pieces of evidence that we're going to discuss today that back up The three pieces of evidence that we have discussed today, which back up the claim that Emily is a part of the Everglot family, 
are that Emily claimed to have fortune before passing, the time period they were set in, and, and the fact that Victoria and Emily have similar features. The pieces of evidence for the second theory are that the residents can do anything and not feel pain, they can freely communicate with animals, and Lord Marcus is taken to another realm as the characters say that he does not deserve to go to the land of the dead. With this being said, I hope the next time you hear a children's story, you think about how it could affect your life. Thank you for, for listening, listening to, to Thumb and Theories. theories.